Welcome to the Sacroiliac Joint Dysfunction and Surgical Intervention Panel Discussion. I'm Dr. Lisa Ferrara and I'm a biomedical engineer that focuses on brain and spine biomechanics and um, surgical fixation systems. And with me, I have three other panel members that will introduce themselves. Dr. Marcus Stone, please. Hi, I'm Dr. Marcus Stone. I'm a clinical research director at the Spine Institute of Louisiana and focus on uh, doing clinical research of the, of the spine. Dr. Ali Kapoor. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ali Kapoor from uh, Mass General Hospital in Boston. I'm the director of biomechanics research at the Department of Neurosurgery. And Dr. Karthik Madhavan. I am Karthik Madhavan. I'm one of the spine surgeons at Sanford Health, uh, North Dakota, Fargo. Thank you. So I'd like to toss out our first question. Um, Dr. Stone and Dr. Madhavan, could you comment on uh, the diagnoses and the processes for sacroiliac joint dysfunction? So I think traditionally, when you look at the training that physicians and particular surgeons receive, when it comes to the SI joint, if you looked you know, 10 years ago or more beyond that, uh, there wasn't a whole lot of, of, of diagnosis uh, sophistication there. And uh, I think that as we've come over the last decade or so to learn more about the SI joint and really understand the biomechanics and, and how it moves and what it looks like in a degenerative state, we've also been able to come light years ahead, I think, on diagnosing SI joint dysfunction through uh, provocative testing and even just a simple port and finger test where the patient points to where their pain is. Mm -hmm. And I know that sounds simple, but you know, again, for years we, we've looked at this and tried to figure out, is this a lumbar problem? Is this a hip problem? But as we've come full circle now back to the, to the SI joint, uh, we've been able to, to look at those different tests and figure out how exactly that, that interplays with everything else. Yeah, I very much agree with uh, Dr. Stone because most of the times what happens in, even during my training, we barely check the SI joint pain. A lot of times the patient who had a spinal fusion used to come back to us complaining of pain right around that area and we thought it was probably just like a chronic back pain until they started to point out exactly where it was. And once I started to notice that, then I went ahead and did a bunch of courses and saw some of the attendings who were starting to do the SI joint fusion. And then I started to do the, <coughs> the specific test, which is um, compression test, the distraction, and um, a Faber test, Genseland test. And when you started to do those, and it became very easily reproducible. And over and over again, I do it almost twice, almost several times the patients are in tears when doing that this, but I warn them before, like I'm going to cause this pain, but it is very important for diagnosis. And the insurance accepts it as SI joint pathology if it is three positive out of the five tests. Excellent. I think that that's a really important distinction to make. It's not just one single test that you look at for a positive. It's three out of five, and when we look at the, the statistics on that, the, the specificity and sensitivity to three out of five it is very high, and we have a, a really high level of confidence that yes, in fact, it is the SI joint. Okay. I have a question for both of you. Is it usually related to a referral from maybe an orthopedic surgeon that focuses on hip pain um, and hasn't been able to distinguish it from uh, any type of hip degenerative or anomaly that may occur? Or do they come to uh, see you for, they assume, back pain versus sacroiliac joint? So for in my personal experience, I've seen most of the patients who come to me is for back pain. And when you really examine them, that's when you figure out it's in the SI joint. The one that has come closest to me more than the hip joint pathology is the <clears throat> is the trochanteric bursa pain. And the patient just points to somewhere here and you will have to physically palpate and see where exactly the pain is. And when you hit the right spot, they almost jump out of the bed. 
or either they flinch or something like that. I'm looking for signs, something like that for the diagnosis. Once I feel that it could overlap, both of them could be the problem, in which case I send them for an injection. And if any one of the pain gets alleviated, I know that was a problem. As long as you have a pain relief, you have hit the right spot. Once you know the pathology, then it is easy to tailor the treatment accordingly. You've made a good point with, the di with respect to the diagnosis um, and clinical treatment for sacral iliac joint dysfunction. We've come so far over the last decade with respect to the clinical research um, and the treatment as well as the biomechanical studies that have been conducted and the predictive computer modeling studies that have been conducted been conducted to really assess the degenerative sacroiliac joint as well as um, possible treatment fixation systems and stabilization of that joint. Biomechanically, it's a joint that even the normal healthy joint has very little motion, very little rotation. It has a very strong triad lig ligamentous structure that biomechanically stabilizes that healthy sacroiliac joint. Um, and as it degenerates, it basically stiffens and has less motion. There's less change. There are very small changes in that motion. Um, and it's difficult to detect because there are small changes. It's a complex joint. Um, Dr. Kapoor, could you um, speak upon some of the biomechanics and the predictive modeling yeah. with respect to the sacroiliac joint? Sure, uh, thank you. So um, computational modeling uh, has come a long way today with the advanced uh, modeling technique that we have and the softwares and um, precise anatomical models which are validated against ex vivo models and testing data. So we can basically simulate uh, different anatomies, different um, basically joint conditions in a computer and understand the load sharing across the joint and the biomechanics of the joint under different loading conditions. So to have a better idea of what really causes or results in pain in the sacroiliac joint, is it because of the activities, the specific things, motions, or it's lo uh, load uh, sharing, or uh, the true uh, causes of uh, basically the dysfunction. Also, another advantage of computational modeling over traditional cadaveric or ex vivo testings is that um, it can give you some parameters that it's really hard to measure in um, experiments, such as load sharing, stresses, like you know, ligament sprains and so on. And also, these models are inexpensive, so they, it, uh, it takes much less time to run a simulation, uh, like predictable and precise, and also they're repeatable. So you can run the same model over and over, again, with different loading conditions and look at different parameters. Well, we've come such a long way with finite element analysis and the computer modeling where we can predict a lot of these situations and also predict how can we best optimize stabilizing that degenerative joint uh, to help reduce pain. With all of the testing and, that's been done on um, cadaveric tissue as well as a lot of the data that's been retrieved from the clinical studies and what we know uh, that we can add as parameters for modeling specific tissue that make up that joint, yeah. we get fairly close to being able to predict the mechanical behavior as well as um, the stability yeah. of that joint exactly. with different surgical interventions, which leads me to my next question for the panel. Uh, let's talk about some of those surgical interventions. We talk about the transverse approach, which is placement of the device across the the sacroiliac joint for fixation versus what we call the inline approach, which is placement of fixation along the sacroiliac joint. Uh, is there a preference? Is there one that may be better than the other? Are there just different situations where you would prefer to use a transverse for versus uh, going across the joint versus inline going along the joint? Um, Dr. Okay. Madigan, can we start with you? <clears throat> So the ones I have already seen being used um, is from going outside in, what you call as the um, transfers. Uh, so what I do basically is, once we confirm that the patient has a SI joint pathology, next thing I do is I send them to a nuclear medicine bone scan. And a lot of times it comes in positive and a lot of times it doesn't. But I still rely on the clinical examination. And the next thing they do is get an injection 
and once they get the injection, if the pain goes away, they have to get at least two injections before uh, they are signed up for SA joint fusion. And then even if the pain goes away, obviously that's where the pathology is coming from. And then one other option that is kind of comes as a second, sometimes and sometimes not, is a radiofrequency ablation of the SA joint nerves, which helps the patient relieve a lot of pain. But the problem with that is the nerves regenerate because it's a peripheral nerve and then the pain can come back again with about six to nine months. And finally, when we get to the surgery, the one I do is going from outside in as a transverse. And what we do is we place in three screws at the SI1, 2, and 3, um, <coughs> locking that SI joint in place. It can be either a screw or a wedge. Both of them, I feel I haven't seen a big difference, but what I have seen is the wedge definitely has a lot more options for the bone to grow through it as compared to the screw which even if it is hollow the amount of bone that can grow through it I don't know if it is really biomechanically strong enough or not okay. so I really like that procedure and on a different side if I'm doing a large fusion T10 to pelvis or something like that when I put in the pelvic screw I do decorticate the SI joint so it locks it there and the whole um, tension of having a long construct doesn't quite get transmitted only to the ileum but also to some extent with the sacrum and it fuses as one bone. So that has helped a lot for me to relieve the pain in SI joint. I would like to add something uh, related to the biomechanics side. So I think there are some good literature related to biomechanical performance and clinical outcomes of different approaches. I think what we have seen through computational modeling is that typically like the posterior or transverse approach uh, leads to a better stabilization uh, in the sacroiliac joint compared to the uh, direct lateral approach. It's because the dominant uh, load and motion applied to the spine is a sagittal plane deflection. That's where the majority of the load and bending moment comes along with the compression. So if you uh, stabilize uh, the joint in that plane, so I think its construct is going to be biomechanically sound and stable. Putting the fixation. Fixation posteriorly. But along but the line, joint, along in, the joint line. in line. Right, with the so joint, yep. the inline approach is what you're saying. Exactly. Is, tends to show that it has better stability. Compared to the direct in, lateral. Compared to direct lateral. Uh, right. So I think the thing that, that maybe the, the next step in all of this is being able to, from a clinical research perspective, compare both approaches and see how that works in the patients and what those patient reported outcomes look like and satisfaction are you know, years down the road. And obviously uh, it's gonna be a little while before we have that question in a, in a direct patient model with you know, all the clinical research that needs to happen. But I, I think that's a very interesting perspective from the the computational modeling. Exactly. I think a patient-specific modeling, I think it's uh, really what's a uh, really hot topic these days because there is no single solution which is perfect for everybody. So different patients have different anatomy. Sometimes the best option is a direct lateral considering mm -hmm. the bone mm -hmm. and quality of the bone and so on. Sometimes you have to go like through the joint. So I think uh, the ultimate goal of the modeling, the biomechanics research is to provide the surgeons and clinicians like an you know, with good insight about like and how to design the surgery the right heart hardware which yields to superior clinical outcomes. Well, and that led, that led <coughs> to my final point with respect to that is, it, you make a valid point that it's dependent upon the patient's anatomy as well as transverse versus inline better for that patient. But also I think there's design nuances with the fixation as well mm -hmm. that may suit certain patients better mm -hmm. than others. Absolutely. So, I mean, I always tend to bring back part of that um, of the fixation, part of it being the design as well. Mm -hmm. How does it anchor the bone, i.e. the screw versus a wedge that has greater surface area or might right. have in-growth capabilities. And now we have screws that have um, open architecture where you may have right. bone in-growth. Right. And let's not forget the <coughs> surgeon in all of this and, no, and, what exactly. and what the surgeon's comfortable with using and how that matches up with the patient Absolutely. and the individual's needs and, and, and all of those things. And it's a very, very complicated situation. Um, and, I, and I think we're, we're really just beginning to understand the SI joint after really, uh, you know, a, a decade of 
really intense focus on the SI joint. That notwithstanding, uh, I, I think we're really just the, kind of the tip of the iceberg of, of what we understand. That's true. And um, I also see one of the big difference between neurosurgery or in general the spine surgeon and the orthopedic trauma surgeons who put a transverse nail all the way through and through the SI joints. And we, when we do it for a degenerative change, we just do it on three screws on each side or three wedges on each side. So I feel that there is also some difference in how the patients will perceive that as well. Absolutely. Definitely. That's going to change the <coughs> load sharing, the joint, yeah. Uh, yeah. how the joint response. Is there one me. beneficial over the other? Obviously, if you have like, you know, three going from each side, they're not like, you know, lined up perfectly. So you just have a, like, you know, some asymmetry, like, you know, have a better load sharing, load you distributions. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so you're not really uh, introducing a new, like a pivot point or something where the joints can spin with respect to, so we have a better stability. And you bring up a good point, you know, not all SI joint fusion is, is the same, mm -hmm. and yeah. the, the underlying causes are not all the same. You know, certainly a distinction should be made between the degenerative case and the, the mm -hmm. trauma case. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, no, nonetheless, I think it's uh, it's it's interesting to look across both, both to, yeah. to see what uh, is maybe best case scenario. Because once when I invited one of the orthopedic trauma guys to see the SI joint fusion I do, he said, I don't prefer this one, I would prefer the other one. And But it is just the surgeon's perspective and what you have learned and what you have experienced mm -hmm. matters also. Oh. Most definitely. Yeah. Well, I think that concludes our session. I'd like to thank all the panel members. And thank you, Lisa. Thank you for your time. Thank you. This was very informative.